just been talking about um, motivation for, I guess, not engaging in certain activities. I'm trying to get away from the idea, at least experimentally, that there are acts that we can say are palpably evil or palpably bad or things that you just mustn't do because you mustn't do them because it's, it's a bad thing to do. That's what I call negative motivation. Um, and I'm sort of edging towards some sort of positive motivation for not doing things. In this case, the example I'm using is the ritual slaughter of animals. Now, um, you can take that a little bit further and you sort of say murdering people. Why would you not want to murder people? Well, in our society, murder is a taboo and anathema. You don't do it under any circumstances, um, at least what we know as murder, as opposed to manslaughter or depraved indifference or something like that. Um, but, you know, when you consciously opt to kill somebody. Um, and I'm saying that, okay, um, as it is now, it's just a, a big don't, and you don't do it, end of story. Well, does somebody have to have done something bad in order for us to lock them up or even kill them? No. Um, there are plenty of legal systems that don't even look into good and evil. Um, it's just, did the person do it or not? Or what damage did this person cause and how do we fix it? That's restorative justice, right? Um, the native Canadian justice system, such as it is, the traditional one works that way. Um, if somebody commits some sort of crime, everybody gets together and says, or at least a council of elders or somebody and says, okay, there's, there's been an injury here. How does this individual make his victim whole. Um, you know, one could say that they would look at our view and, you know, I kill somebody so I get locked up for 40 years or whatever. They would just sort of say, how did you fix anything? You didn't fix anything. All you did was toss this guy in jail. The victim gets nothing. The victim's family gets nothing. Um, in their view, you, you've sort of, in a sense, you've violated kind of a contract, which is, you know, the social contract. You've killed somebody, therefore you've damaged other people, or you've damaged the, the person, and you've damaged everyone in their family, in their circle of friends, everyone who knows them, and you've damaged the community. How can you fix this? Well, we lock you up for 40 years. Well, how does that help the community? Well, it gets you out of the way. But yes, it does get me out of the way, but it doesn't fix the damage that I've done. So they say, okay, then they start negotiating, and then that's how it works. But the, our way of thinking is you can't do that because you're putting a price on human life. Well, it's not really putting a price on it. We're just trying to say he's done damage and we want him to fix it. Um, we don't, it's, it's not so much a case of punishment. Now, don't get me wrong. Native Canadians are humans like anybody else. And if you hit them, they want to hit you back. Um, and, you know, they, they've lived among us, I guess you would say, if you want to look, if you go us and them, and their, their thinking is migrating in our general direction. But as a, you know, on, on a continuum, their view of things is restorative as opposed to punitive. Most pre-Christian or pre-Islamic legal codes work that way. You have injured somebody else. You are now in their debt, and there is we have to establish a payment plan, as it were, for you to get out of their debt. It might be overwhelming, of course. You murder somebody, well, okay, you're talking, I don't know, fixing things that are well beyond most people's ability to fix. So then you've got to say, okay, well, that's that. We've, um, you can't pay the debt that you're in off with your head. You know, that sort of thing. Um, okay, does that really say that the person is evil? Not necessarily. Um, you know, the, the old word guilt system, the feud systems, vendetta systems, this sort of thing. It works like that. You've injured me, I have to injure you, or you owe me something, whatever. Now, I'm not saying that we go back to that. I'm just saying that there is an alternative there. Second 
uh, issue is people are saying, well, no, no, you have to, you can't go into the intuitive because what that does is it really makes things vague. That's kind of the problem with um, restorative justice, especially blended with the intuitive. How do you set a price there? Or how do you set a debt that this person is in if you're, if you're intuitive? Well, how much have you injured this person? Well, how do you measure the intuitive injury, the injury that you've caused somebody else? We already do that. People say that you can't do that. You can't rely on the intuitive. And, and I'm talking legal here, which is kind of against the grain of what I was talking about previously. But since we're going down this road, by the way, um, we're already doing that. We already rely 100% on the intuitive to assess injury. Why don't I like being struck by a wooden cane across my bare back. Why don't I like that? Well, it's painful. Okay, why don't I like pain? Uh, <laughs> how do you answer that? It's intuitive, isn't it? I just don't like pain. We all know that we don't like pain. Okay, can you explain to me why you don't like pain? Well, the modern person will say, well, because pain receptors are there to warn me of damage, etc., etc. No, they're not there to warn you of anything. They do that, but they weren't, nothing has designed them to do that. Uh, that's, you know, that's God talk, right? There's no point to having a central nervous system. It's not there for any purpose. It just evolved through randomness. Uh, the changes in the environment meant that people who developed a sophisticated, or the beings that developed a central nervous system, were more likely to have offspring. That's it. There's no purpose for my central nervous system. So you can't say that the central nervous system is there to prevent injury, because it isn't. Um, so why don't I like suffering? Uh, well, what kind of an idiot likes suffering? Well, no, no, you, that's an evasion. Answer the question. Why don't you like suffering? Why don't you like being deprived? Why don't you like all these other things? That is 100% intuitive. We already rely on the intuitive and our legal, ethical, moral, and even conscientious systems are all based on the intuitive Look at something like veganism. You say, well, I don't want to do all of these things. I don't want to engage in any activity that causes an animal to suffer. Fair enough. Why don't you want to do that? Well, I, I don't want the animal to suffer. And I don't want anyone else to engage in any activity that causes an animal to suffer. What's wrong with the animal suffering? Well, people just take it as axiomatic, of course, which, which it is. It is an axiom. It's so patently obvious that we don't question it. Well, now I'm questioning it. And I'm not questioning the rightness or wrongness of our view of suffering. But what is suffering? Suffering is intuitive. It is utterly intuitive. And all of our legal thinking is based on the idea that you've either damaged somebody or put them in a deficit. And all of that is based upon our notion of suffering. I have caused another being to suffer. Suffering is intuitive. All of that, all of our, all the vast moral, legal, ethical edifice that we've built has been built upon a foundation that is utterly intuitive. So by saying that the intuitive might be the best motivator, I'm simply facing the fact that the whole basis of having an ethical code in the first place, or a moral code, or a legal code, is intuitive. So rather than saying, oh, we have to rely 100% on reason, which our legal system and our moral system and our ethical systems, our oughts and ought-nots, are all based on the, the intuitive, um, uh, since they're all based on the intuitive, rather, we're not even really dealing with a rational, reasonable, logical, ethical, co uh, ethical, moral, or legal code. 
or even understandings, even the, 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 the unspoken rules of life. All of it's based on the intuitive. It is not rational. It is based upon an axiom and an axiom that can be challenged and I'm challenging it. Suffering is intuitive. Let's not kid ourselves.